Uh, before we get there, we've got um, one more. The last lecture that's key is by Thomas O'Dell, who is online, I believe. Ooh. Let me find him here. Where? On the, look at the screen. In the middle. And he will yeah, no, apply to the data and the God world relation. Apply to the data and the God world relation. He is the uh over to Dr. O'Brien. Just put the volume up on it. Just one second. Uh, can you can hear us? Yes, 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 yes. I can. Can you hear me? Yes. I will put him up and I'll put him on mute. Sorry, did you want me to share my screen for the slides? Thank you very much. Yes, 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 yes please. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, just a sec. Um, is that okay? Do you have the slides or do you see the presenter view? Can he yes. uh, We see you on our screen here. You're going to share your uh, screen. So you have to share your screen with us. Okay. Um, how's that? Amazing. Amazing. Okay. Um, and are you still seeing the slide or are you seeing the presenter view? Now we see no, both no, the slide no, and the presenter. Oh, I see, I see. Sorry about that. No, I think that's no, good the way it is. Oh. You can so just is that start. okay? Just start. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so we're good to go? Yes, we yeah, are. We are. Okay. All right. Uh, sorry about the delay there. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy to be a part of this conference and to participate online. Um, I think this is a, it's just a really great uh, sort of topic overall. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, Advaita Vedanta and a sort of conceptual or logical problem that arises when we start to consider sort of the relationship between um, Brahman and the world. And I think uh, the Brett in the previous talk sort of covered some ground that I'm already that I'm going to talk about. So that's great. It kind of um, sort of gives some context already for for what we're going to talk about here. Um, so yeah, Advaita is this um, this sort of non dualistic or monistic tradition of Indian philosophy, and it's sort of most um, famously associated with uh, Shankara. Uh, but others who sort of preceded him as well. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about um, Shankara's views as well. Um, now, what I'm going to talk about is what I call um, the asymmetry problem. Um, and again, this is kind of a conceptual problem that arises for Advaita. Um, and so th the first part of the problem is, is what I'll just call non-dualism. Um, and this is just sort of this just kind of characterizes the view of Advaita. So Advaita just means non-dual. Um, and so I take it this amounts to a kind of, um, you know, very strict form of monism or what's called sometimes existence monism. Um, and so it's the view that just Brahman is the sole existent, right? So Brahman is the notion of God or the divine, the sort of fundamental um, 
source or ground of everything, right? The, the idea for Advaita is that, you know, ultimately speaking, um, it's just Brahman that exists, right? Um, and so I've sort of formulated that below uh, a bit more formally. Um, there is some X such that for every Y, X is equal to Y, right? So just the idea that um, there is just one thing that exists, right? What's interesting to me is that you also find um, proponents within the tradition and both commentaries of, of the tradition making this claim as well, which I call asymmetry, which is that the world asymmetrically depends upon Brahman for its existence. Um, and so I've, I've just formulated that below as well. If we let D denote the relation of dependence here, um, we just get there is an X and a Y such that X depends on Y. And it's not the case that Y depends on X, right? So we're just trying to cash out this idea that um, there's this asymmetrical relation of sort of like ontological dependence um, or what I'll later characterize as grounding, right? But um, the world sort of depends for its existence on Brahman, um, but not vice versa, right? So the problem here is that these are contradictory, right? Um, they they cannot both be true. Um, I won't I won't put a proof on the screen, but if you just sort of think about it, sort of intuitively, right? If if we if we grant non dualism and and we say all that exists is Brahman, then if you consider you know the formula for asymmetry, then what what you would get is the statement that x is equal to sorry x depends on x, and it is not the case that x depends on x, right? So you you can derive a sort of straightforward contradiction right um so th this is a problem right because i take it that um both of these claims are sort of central to advaita itself right um definitely non-dualism is is a key component because that just sort of characterizes advaita um but it seems that asymmetry is also a sort of core claim of you know what advaitins want to say about uh, the world in relation to brahman so um so that this is a sort of logical problem right so what i'm going to do in this talk is um i'm first going to characterize asymmetry a little bit further in a little bit more detail sorry detail but then i'm going to look at some potential solutions to this problem um i'm going to look at a couple potential solutions within the Advaita tradition itself. So we're gonna look at um, sort of Shankara's theory of causation, um, and then his distinction, which uh, Brett briefly talked about earlier about sort of levels of being or levels of truth or something like this. Um, then I'm gonna consider a solution from the sort of contemporary metaphysics literature, um, what I call identity grounding. Um, and I'm gonna argue that none of these solutions are, are viable. I think, you know, originally I was, sort of sanguine about um, appealing to some kind of solution to solve this conceptual difficulty, this sort of logical contradiction. Um, I'm, I'm not so sanguine anymore. I don't think, I mean, we could sort of keep hammering out solutions. There's probably other potential ones. Um, I just don't think they really work that well. And then, um, you know, you might think that gives us reason to sort of reject Advaita if, if my claim is true that this contradiction is sort of central to the view itself. Um, I'm going to argue that that, um, that's not, that doesn't necessarily follow, that even if we're faced with this sort of logical contradiction at the heart of Advaita, um, the Advaitin still has sort of principled reasons um, for affirming uh, a form of mysterianism. And so I'm going to argue that um, I think that's the move that the Advaitin should make, and indeed I think the one that Advaitins do typically make. Um, but what I'm going to argue is that this mysterian move, this move towards mysterianism, where roughly we, we sort of affirm both asymmetry and non-dualism, um, um, but we there's in some sense we don't know how they could be both be true, right? I'm going to argue that um, this is a legitimate sort of dialectical move that the Advaitin can make. So that's where I'm going with the talk. So um, so the first claim then, what I call asymmetry, the sort of view that th the world asymmetrically depends on Brahman, right? So um, you find this um, you find this in the primary literature. Uh, here's one example uh, with Shankar's commentary on the Brahma Sutra. 
Um, and he, he's bringing up this example of the sort of analogy of the clay pot and the clay. You also find it in the um, sort of sec discourse six in the Chandogya Upanishad. Um, but he writes, uh, when a clod of earth, or sometimes it's translated as clay, right? Uh, when a clod of earth is understood to be in essence, but mere earth only, all things made of earth, such as a jar, a trough, and a water pot, is not in existence substantially as an effect as such, but is merely a name and is false or untrue, and that it merely is but earth only is the truth. This is stated as an illustration of Brahma. Therefore, it is understood that in the case of the thing illustrated also, all creation as a class as such has no existence as apart from Brahma. So what you get is this sort of, you know, this example or illustration of um, a clay pot and the, the clay, you know, the, the clay, the pot is sort of constituted by the clay, or we could say uh, the clay is like the material cause of the pot. Um, um, so, you know, sometimes we, we have these Aristotelian categories imposed on Shankar. I'm not sure if that's a good idea or not. Um, some people take issue with that. But either way, um, you have this idea that like the, the pot itself, um, its existence as such is just purely derived from dependent upon the underlying cause, namely the clay, right? It has no sort of independent being or existence. Um, and then here's a sort of more contemporary uh, formulation of this by Neil Dalal. He says, the pot depends on Clay for its being, its form and mass possess no objective existence apart from its clay substance. Therefore, the clay is more real based on a hierarchy of dependency. Um, and there, there are many more examples of um, people sort of affirming this kind of asymmetrical relation, right? And so this is supposed to be analogous with Brahman in the world, right? It's supposed to be like Brahman um, is like the material cause of the world. So the world is like constituted out of Brahman or something like this, right? But the idea is that there's no real independent existence of the world apart from Brahman. So that's that's the analogy is supposed to illustrate this sort of asymmetrical um, sort of hierarchical view. Um, my, my sort of working hypothesis here is that Shankara, when he's talking about causation or dependence, because uh, I've phrased asymmetry in terms of this notion of dependence. I think he's maybe talking about a, a more non-causal notion of dependence, like metaphysical grounding. So in the contemporary literature, grounding is is understood to be um, a kind of non-causal notion of, of dependence. There, there are different versions, but um, so so if you say like... Um, if you if you talk about objects, like if you say the table depends for its existence, or if the table is grounded, existence of the table is grounded in the existence of its parts, or something like that. This is a kind of we're not saying that the the parts cause the table to exist, right? So we're talking about like this in virtue of relation that picks out a sort of synchronic notion of dependence, sort of through levels of reality, as it were. Um, I'm not sure about this, but I suspect maybe Shankara has something like this in mind because it, it looks like the notion of dependencies targeting here is productive or generative. So it looks like he wants to say um, the, the pot sort of just has its being, its existence derived from the clay or the world insofar as it exists, it derives its existence distance from Brahman, right? So there's this kind of like existentially productive, like production going on. You're one thing deriving its existence from another. And so um, that might be reason to think we're talking about something like grounding as opposed to just material constitution. It looks like it's non-causal, right? So when Shankar is talking about the clay and the clay pot, um, this isn't really a, talking about a dependence process of dependence that's unfolding over time, like one event occurring and then another event occurring. It looks like we're talking about a sort of synchronic notion of dependence through levels of reality, not really spread out over time. Um, and you do have this constitutive element, right? So it's often cash out in terms of material causation. Um, but again, grounding is supposed to be kind of constitutive through levels. Um, so th that's that's my sort of working hypothesis that he's, he's sort of working with this notion of a non-causal notion of dependence. And then what you get with foundationalism in the contemporary literature is this idea that 
every sort of derivative entity is ultimately grounded in some fundamental entities, right? Um, and so um, you might think Shankar is giving you a kind of conception of foundationalism insofar as you can talk about um, the world, it's it's sort of ultimate, Brahman's the sort of ultimate fundamental source of everything else, right? Um, and so I think this can be useful to sort of look at Advaita through this contemporary lens. For for one, it's I'll consider a solution to the asymmetry problem later that appeals to this notion of grounding. Um, so that could be helpful. I think in general, um, it's not always clear what Shankar is talking about, if he's talking about causation as we would think of it, or if he's talking about a sort of more non-causal notion of dependence. And so I think if we can um, appeal to a sort of contemporary framework that is a bit more uh, detailed about this, we can sort of look back, not that we want to impose it on Shankara, but we can sort of look back and sort of ask this question, like, can this contemporary framework be helpful for understanding some of these metaphysical issues? And how do these issues and invite to map onto uh, a sort of more contemporary framework? I think that can be a sort of useful and productive um, uh, task. So again, here's the problem. Once more, just to jog your memory, we've got these two claims. They appear to be both central to Advaita and they're contradictory, right? So non-dualism, Brahman just as the sole existent, and then asymmetry, the world asymmetrically depends upon Brahman for its existence. So I'm going to now move into um, considering potential solutions to this problem, right? Um, and the the first one, the first two are sort of um, appealing to things that Shankar says sort of within the tradition itself. Um, so uh, Shankara has this, this interesting view of causation where he says effects are in some sense non-different from their causes, right? Um, and so it's this idea that the effect is in some sense uh, illusory or it's in some sense like an appearance. Um, the idea I take it is that you don't get the effect sort of it's not a sort of sui generi sort of new thing. It sort of was latent in the cause already. Um, in some sense, it just is the cause, right? So to use the example of the clay pot again, the, the pot is supposed to be the effect of, in some sense of the pot, but it it's not something new. It was already sort of in the clay or something to begin with. Um, and so I take it, you know, Shankar is appealing to this notion. He in some sense has to have this kind of view, right? Because if we're aff affirming a sort of strict form of monism and we want to say the world is the effect of Brahman, then, um, and there just is Brahman, then it looks like you kind of have to say the effect is in some sense identical to or non-different from its cause, right? And you, so you might think this sort of theory of causation go some way into solving this asymmetry problem of how Brahman is the only existent and yet the world depends on Brahman. Um, and if we were just trying to, in some sense, reconcile the appearance of the world um, with the fact that Brahman is the only existent, while well, we say the effect is non-different from the cause, right? So you might think this goes some way to, to solving this tension. I, I don't think it does, and it, we face kind of a dilemma here, right? So we could say for Shankara, either effects are strictly numerically identical with their causes or not. And I found a commentary like in the secondary literature, there seems to be disagreement about this. Some people want to say for Shankara, effects just are identical. Some people uh, like Rambachan will say that no, effects are not numerically identical. The effect sort of shares its essential nature with the cause, but is strictly speaking distinct from the cause. Either way, I don't think it bodes very well. Um, so, you know, if we if we take the the first view that effects are just numerically identical with their causes, um, then what you end up saying is that the world, if it's the effect of Brahman, just is identical. So there's now there's just this relation of identity that we're talking about. There is no sort of asymmetrical relation, right? So it looks like you would just end up denying asymmetry to solve the problem, right? And you might think that's fine. Um, it might be problematic insofar as you think affirming this view that the world asymmetrically depends on Brahman is important, um, is something we need to keep on board to characterize Advaita, right? Um, that might be problematic. Um, it's also 
also kind of weird to, to talk about causation or dependence in this way as a as being identical because our sort of pre-theoretic notion of dependence or causation is it, it's an asymmetric notion right whereas identity is is symmetric so that's that's problematic i think um and then if not you know if effects are not numerically identical with their causes then it you know it looks like no, non-dualism will be false right so um you could say something like the effect shares its essential nature with the cause but has distinct properties from the cause you know and then by leibniz's law it follows they're distinct right um and we can't let go of non-dualism because then we will just jettison advaita itself right um so either way it doesn't look like shankar's theory of causation just appealing to that theory alone is going to help us solve the asymmetry problem Um, Brett brought, brought this up in his talk, but we, we can maybe now appeal to Shankar's sort of distinction between like levels of being. Um, I think Brett maybe talked about this in terms of notion of levels of truth. I'm not sure if, if there's a difference here or not, but, uh, there's sort of one, one distinction Shankar makes between, um, the sort of conventional empirical reality of appearance, that is the universe, and then the sort of ultimate reality of, um, you know, Brahman's, Brahman's non-dual existence, right? And so um, the idea is that Shankar is supposedly only qualifiedly or provisionally accepts the former, right? So it's like we can talk about the world, the appearance of the world and plurality, and we can talk about causal relations or dependence relations between the world and Brahman, but that's only a provisional sort of way of talking. That ontology, that sort of hierarchical ontology of the world, depending on Brahman, is merely provisional from a sort of ultimate standpoint. Um, there just is Brahman, right? And so then um, this sort of fits into this this further distinction. I think Brad had four four distinctions. I, I just have the three, but um, we've got this distinction between the real, the false, uh, and the unreal, right? So the false is sort of that which is neither real nor unreal. It's sort of this middle, like indeterminate. Um, state of being or something right and um so supposedly the, the, the empirical world of appearance and all its distinctions and relations of dependence etc is supposed to fall within this sort of indeterminate category of the false right um it's it's neither real nor unreal um the idea then is that if we go back to our two main claims, non-dualism and asymmetry, asymmetry being the claim that the world asymmetrically depends on Brahman, um, we sort of need to uh, reevaluate this, right? Because it, it's the idea is supposed to be, I guess, a, the claim of asymmetry is only in some sense provisionally true, or it's like kind of dispensable in some sense. Um, you sort of accept it um, at some point, but then ultimately reject it or something like that. So again, um, Dalal writes, from the empirical standpoint, the sort of standpoint of like the world of appearance and plurality, these two orders, you know, ultimate and then the prov provisional seem to exist simultaneously and possess an asymmetrical relationship. Not only from the absolute standpoint, does empirical reality collapse into Brahman. The ultimate reality perspective metaphysically devours the world all of its causation and even its status as an appearance from the non-dual standpoint, the sort of ultimate standpoint, there just is only Brahman. And so, you know, this kind of reminds me of um, like Wittgenstein's ladder, right? It's like you, you accept something provisionally, the sort of hierarchical ontology of the world and Brahman. Once you get up to the top of the ladder, you know, you, you just kick it away. You don't really need it anymore. Right. Um, and so you might think this, this appealing to sort of this, these distinctions can help us alleviate the tension between asymmetry and non-dualism because then it looks like um, ultimately you're just sort of rejecting asymmetry, right? So I have some reservations about this. One, again, if this just amounts to rejecting asymmetry, the claim that the world asymmetrically depends on the world, then it, 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 at least in part, it looks like you're kind of giving up on explaining the appearances, right? Um, so any sort of monistic philosophy, I think, is going to face the challenge of explaining the appearances, right? What if if 
if monism is true, a very strict form, then why do why does there appear to be a world of plurality, right? Um, and so I, Advaita is no exception to this rule, right? Um, if if we just give up on asymmetry, then it looks like you're sort of giving up on any a, attempt to explain the appearances. But there's another issue, uh, and I find Shankara's distinction kind of odd because he wants to relegate the world of, of appearance into this sort of indeterminate category of being neither real nor unreal. And that that to me just seems odd because it's you're in, in some sense you're granting that it has some type of being, it has some type of existence, right? Um, and just saying that it maybe has a lesser degree of existence than Brahman doesn't um it still commits you to the the claim that it exists in some sense, right? And and insofar as anything exists apart from Brahman, this is inconsistent with non-dualism. Um, so those are the reservations I have uh, about this sort of attempt to maybe um, solve the sort of puzzle between asymmetry and non-dualism. Uh, there's one further approach I'll consider here, and this is sort of appealing to more uh, contemporary issues. So remember, I sort of have the working hypothesis that maybe Shankar is talking about um, a sort of non-causal notion of grounding when he's characterizing the world as dependent on on Brahman. So here's maybe one potential solution. In not, in line with non-dualism, maybe we can affirm that the relation between Brahman and the world is strict numerical identity. So we, we just affirm because Brahman alone exists insofar as you can talk about the world of appearance, um, the world is just identical with Brahman, right? There is nothing distinct from Brahman. So what we're doing here is denying asymmetry to solve the puzzle. And earlier I had reservations about that, but you might sort of circumvent this by trying to preserve the intuition underlying asymmetry by saying identity is a grounding relation. Um, so the relation, we could say Brahman is identical to the world or, or the world is identical to Brahman, but... Um, in some cases, I suppose, identity can be a type of dependence or grounding relation. Um, there are some people in the sort of contemporary space who make this kind of claim. So Jessica w Wilson argues, for investigating grounding, we aim to make sense of the usual idioms of metaphysical dependence. And identity claims are paradigmatic of claims taken to establish that certain goings on are nothing over and above certain other goings on. So one example of this that comes up is uh, in the philosophy of mind. So if you have like a mind-brain identity theory where um, the mental in some is identical to so like certain mental states or identical to certain brain states, um, you would say something like the mental goings on or nothing over and above uh, the sort of physical goings on in the brain or something like this, right? So we, we're making an identity claim, but it looks like by saying one reduces to the other, it looks like we're always we're also talking about a, a notion of dependence as well. So at least on her view, she thinks identity in these cases can can be understood as a kind of grounding relation. Um, so you might think that maybe that can help solve with this issue. Um, I I don't think it can. I think this really just is incoherent. I think. Um, well, the, the formal properties of these two relations, right, identity and grounding or identity and dependence are just incompatible, right? Identity is an equivalence relation. It's symmetric, reflexive, and transitive. Grounding is asymmetric, right? It's um, it's anti-symmetric and irreflexive. So the, the formal properties are just incompatible. Um, and then you might say, well, that means, you know, grounding can be reflexive, you know, things can depend on itself, or it can be symmetric, two things can mutually ground each other, right? Um, and I just, I don't think that works. I think this notion of grounding or dependence, the role that it typically plays in ontology is a kind of structuring role. If you say F grounds G, F is more fundamental than G, right? So you've, that relation is a, an asymmetric one. So it looks like the notion of dependence or grounding um, the very role that it's supposed to play, um, it just imposes constraints on its logic. Um, so those are some solutions, potential solutions. I kind of thought this last one might be 
plausible. I'm not, as I said at the start, I'm not, uh, I'm not too optimistic anymore that there is some way of sort of um, alleviating this tension uh, between these two claims, asymmetry and non-dualism. Um, does that mean we should then give up on Advaita? Should we just reject Advaita as being in incoherent? And I don't think that's the case. I think um, the Advaitin has sort of principled reasons to think that, you know, when we're talking about or with respect to sort of transcendent or ultimate matters, intelligibility is not to be had sort of by logical operations of thought or discursive reason to begin with. I think we can appeal to a sort of version of mysterianism um, that roughly says, you know, we affirm both non-dualism and, and asymmetry um, and they're contradictory, but so we cannot in principle sort of know how both could be true. Um, and I'm not going to give an analysis of what a mystery involves here. There, there's different senses in which something could be a mystery. But what I want to argue is that this move of appealing to mysterianism is not sort of dialectically illicit or illegitimate. So I think uh, there's sort of evidence for this sort of view in the primary literature. Here's, here's just a couple examples. Um, in the Bhagavad Gita, we read, my true being is unborn and changeless. I am the Lord who dwells in every creature. Through the power of my own maya, I manifest in a finite form. And then again, few see through the veil of maya. The world deluded does not know that I am without birth and changeless. So um, if you can have maya is sort of connoting this notion of mystery you might think this these are maybe two examples in the primary literature um, that appeal to a notion of mystery uh, but it's it's often appealed to in the secondary literature as well so rambachan writes advaita admits that the world and its relationship to brahman is an indefinable mystery analogies are aids to understanding but these are not meant to fully explain the relationship between brahman and the world now there's an obvious challenge here right which is that it looks like we've um, discovered a sort of contradiction between two claims that are central to Advaita. And then um, in response to all these failed solutions, you just appeal to mystery. And it looks like that's it looks like that's just ad hoc. It looks like that's illegitimate and arbitrary. It looks like you should, you know, find reasons to motivate mysterianism that are independent of arriving at this sort of logical problem in the first place. Otherwise, appealing to mystery just looks like you're um, making an illegitimate move here. Um, and I don't think that's right, actually. I think um, the very conception of Brahman as a sort of ultimate transcendent reality is, is one that is in some sense beyond discursive reason or beyond thought altogether, right? And so um, I think these logical problems with Advaita um, give evidence in some sense that there just is already a form of intelligibility not accessible to the discursive intellect right so i think if the problem have, uh, five or well, five minutes or less than 10 minutes including questions and answers oh so do you want me to wrap up yes i do yeah well that that's pretty much it um i think it's it's not a um not an illicit move, right, to appeal. And we shouldn't, you know, um, find it surprising that we run into these logical problems when considering things like transcendent reality. So that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, it, it, yeah, the microphone is on. You can ask some questions. Okay, thanks, Tom. Sorry to cut you short. Like at the end there, you're running quite short on time right now. You have to evacuate pretty soon. Okay. Um, so thank you for uh, not giving up on the advancing case. Um, appreciate it. Good talk. Um, if there's any questions in the room? Okay, Ravi, please. Yeah, thank you for that talk, Thomas. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Just put your thumb up. Yeah, no, you can. You can. You can. You can. Okay. Um, so this is Ravi Gupta, Utah State University. Um, I, um, I was wondering to what extent is this problem that you bring up uh, anticipated by Shankara's critics, like uh, Ramanuja, for example, uh, in his... Um, Seven Great Untenables, Sapta Vidha Anupapati, where, where he's concerned primarily with 
how do we locate the world in relation to Shankara um, in um, in his system, and and you know it's essentially describing seven untenables or logical contradictions. Um, is is this problem you're raising? Is it anticipated in any way uh, by um, by Ramanuja or the other numerous critics of Shankara? Um, it's it's a good question. I do, I don't know. I'm not that familiar with Ramanuja. Um, I mean, there there are different aspects of Vedanta that Brett covered, where they sort of endorse. I mean, qualified versions of monism, which I think can get around this issue. I don't know if Ramanuja is going to appeal to something like that, but uh, it's so it's a it's a good question though. I'd have to look into this further. Yeah, you can start. Okay. Oh, one thing I might suggest um, that work, uh, John Grimes has uh, a really nice little book uh, called The Seven Great Untenables. Um, it's, it's, it's not very large at all, and he just goes through the, these seven points that Ramanuja makes, and I think there would be a good starting point to, to look for parallels. Okay, thank you so much. Um, hi, thank you for that. Um, can I can I follow up with a clarification of how the terms interact and they might and ask how you might think of that? Um, I've had discussions with people about Advaita Vedanta and Shankara specifically about more than you know, in contrast to my and that um, grounding is a purely logical relation, and the difference being between Majamaka and Advaita Vedanta is that he can feel application to presuppositional reasoning and ultimately scripture to the human family, which would, as you said, not be subject to like the logic. Um, but I wonder why Sorry, can you speak up? I can't quite hear. That was a theme and that was the truth, because they've already imposed in like modern logical terms on it. I do think they're different. I think that makes a difference where grounding doesn't have to be coherent because it's not incoherent. Could someone uh, sort of summarize that last point? I couldn't quite hear. Just if there is a difference between levels of truth and levels of being, would that affect your analysis? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I th I think um I th I think it might so maybe you need to make this distinction between um yeah because I, if what we're talking about are these two claims non-dualism and asymmetry and and it looks like they're contradictory right if both are true but but if we can make sort of some distinction between um levels of truth um in some sense, maybe that can help. This is something I'll have to look more into. Um, I'm I'm just not sure how far that's going to go in solving the problem. But um, the the main issue I have is is making this claim right that like the world in some sense depends on Brahman. So um, yeah, I'll, I'm not too sure to be honest. There's one more question. Um, okay, Mr. Benedict. Oh, yeah, this hand up earlier. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I mean, basically, on, on your first slide, uh, the way you formalize non duality and uh, asymmetry, have, have you tried other ways of uh, trying to formalize a non duality? Because you're quite straightforward here, yeah, because there's an X and for a Y, X is Y. Have you tried like uh, meteorological formalizations or partwood relations where you don't obtain a forward logical contradiction? Um, I you you could I I really wouldn't know how. Um, I th I thought it was a fairly natural sort of non question begging way to formulate these claims. Um, I suppose it would be worth trying to formulate it differently. Um, the the qu yeah the question then would be, um, which is the more natural formulation, right? Yeah.
Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm Manama, I'm from Toronto. Um, my question is just, do you think, so like just imagine that I'm the only existent and I'm imagining things that aren't real. So non-dualism is true because I'm the only existent. Asymmetry is true because my illusions depend on me. Do you think that that causes an asymmetry problem or is that just, um, I, don't, I, I guess like to me, I, I see how this problem arises if the world is different from Brahman. But if you think of the world as like illusions or something, then it just seems like this very cognitive view of just how co how, how cognition works, basically. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you, you hear this, right? It's like, uh, this is raised in the context like of a dream or something, right? If you're having a dream. Um, I don't, I don't know. I think in some sense, it depends what you're, you're quantifying over, right? If, if you're sort of talking about things distinct from Brahman, you're quantifying over the existence of the world. That's problematic, right? But it's, it's problematic mostly for logical reasons, right? Which is, um, when some, in part, an asymmetrical relation is just it, its formal properties are incompatible with identity, right? Um, so, and then if you say, you know, the world depends on Brahman, you're committed to saying there's something distinct from from Brahman, right? So that, that just isn't consistent with non-dualism. It's consistent with a qualified form of monism, right? So in other Vedanta traditions, you have a more qualified version, which is like Brahman is the only fundamental entity so the world can exist in a dependent manner but brahman it's monistic in the sense that brahman's there's only one fundamental entity brahman but if you're going to go a more extreme route the sort of radically sort of existence monism like Bra brahman is the only thing that i just don't see how you can talk about anything distinct from brahman let alone say there's an asymmetric relation that obtains between the two